Hey, hey, and welcome back to another great episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. My name is Mark Pattison, former NFL player, now climbing the seven summits. In fact, I've got Mount Everest 11 months and counting, and I cannot wait for that. I've got this great quote, live as if you were to die tomorrow and learn as if you were to live forever. I think my guest this week fully fits this criteria. His name is Randy Hetrick, and he is the the CEO and founder of TRX. I'm sure we've all been in a gym. You've looked around the corner, and there'll be some bars, and hanging down from some bars are these yellow and black straps, and people are doing all these different TRX-type exercises. It's really grown into a phenomena, continues to grow, and uh, we go through that whole thing. So Randy is a guy that's very accomplished, very driven. He went to USC and, and rode there on the crew team, then went off to a 14-year Navy SEAL career, then came back and, of course, topped that off with going to Stanford, going to the business school. And so we go through this and really how his whole idea, his invention came up, the challenges of, of getting TRX off the ground. The ideas are always the hardest, but then actually propelling those things up the mountain until they start to get some momentum is always the hard part. And he did that. He has done that. And But all these things, despite the successes that they have, always have their ups and downs from financing to product development to perfecting what they're doing. And really, where do you go from here now that the company has grown to over $50 million. So congrats to him. We'll get to uh, his story in a mon- minute. It is fascinating and uh, can't wait for that. Okay, so as always, if you want to go check out what's going on with me, I am headed off to Mount Everest. So I've got my climbing, my tips, my e-learning course. I'm speaking around the country, which is super fun. And you can find that at markpattisonnfl.com. Okay, so go check that out. And if you haven't already done so, please give me a rating and review Finding Your Summit on iTunes. It really helps in the Alpha world. Also, if you know somebody that would be a great guest for this show, Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way, please let me know. And again, you can you can drop me a note on my website. I respond to everyone, okay? And finally, this podcast is sponsored by VioletsAreBlueSkinCare.com. The founder, Cynthia Bestman, she has been on the pod. She is a survivor of cancer, and she's a rock star. So check that out. Okay, on that note, let's go listen to Randy. Here we go. Hey, everybody, it's Mark Pattison back again with another phenomenal episode of Finding Your Summit, all about people overcoming adversity and finding their way. This week, I'm jacked to have this guy because I've been chasing him down like a Navy SEAL myself for the last six months. And finally, on the assist of Eddie Pops, who we both know, Jim Moore, who we both know, and Sean and Marnie, we finally gathered and, and trapped this guy. So we are on the podcast today. I've got Randy Hetrick. Randy, how you doing? I'm great, Mark. Great to finally be with you. Yeah, it's taken us uh, it's taken us some doing to get here. So we better produce something good. Well, I had some intel, so I knew I could finally get you and, and reach you. And, and anyway, so to the uh, to the audience today, we've got the the founder of TRX. He's also a guy. He was a Navy SEAL for 14 years. He went to USC with my other buddy, Sean Finn, and is a MBA grad. And so you've got all these things going on. And, you know, so Randy, this is, I, I want to kick this thing off by really trying to understand the motivation and really going back to your youth. And, and I'm truly uh, trying to understand and doing all this research. I mean, we'll get into the whole TRX and the growth and how amazing this new phenomena really has gone across America, I'm sure the world. But it's always really about the motivation of one that, that stems these different things to chase dreams, to go after different things that most people don't go after. So let's start back. Where did you grow up and what kind of childhood did you have? I grew up in Southern California, down initially in Corona del Mar, and then moved up to Huntington for high school. And you know, I had a I had a great childhood. I um, it was funny. I was talking to somebody just a couple of days ago about this, but I, I was sick a lot as a kid. I had really chronic allergies, and weirdly, they would always turn into bronchitis and then pneumonia. So I, by the time I was I don't know eight years old, I'd been hospitalized six different times for, you know, really severe pneumonia. 
And that stuck with me till really into my early teens. I, I was just sick a lot. And, and I think, um, you know, I'm sure that had, that had some played some role internally in me deciding that, you know, ultimately hell or high water, I was going to become this physical being that was going to sh- show the world that I actually wasn't a little, you know, sickly wimp. And, uh, and then through high school, then, then I started, I was always a late bloomer and really young, right? I'm an October kid. And unfortunately my folks had started me on the wrong side of the, uh, yeah. you know, of the year, year divide. They should have rolled me a year back. And that way I'd have been one of the older kids or at least in the middle, you know, instead of always the youngest kid. But in high school, the jets started to turn on a little bit and I started to have some success with sports and uh, and then it just kind of built from there. But I, don't know, I, I, I had a great, great childhood, great parents. I got, I got no complaints. Yeah. So, you know, it's interesting because uh, I, I was thinking about this the other day and actually doing a, a, a speech in Miami uh, in a couple of weeks. And, and one of the things that was striking as I look back and really reflected on my time is that in high school as an athlete, I could pretty much run around and do the things that I wanted to do, but I really never learned that work ethic, right? And so it really wasn't until I got to uh, into college under Don James, he taught me about the pyramid of success. And it was really a sink or swim. You know, it was really either I bulk up, I was 6'2", 181 pounds, could not bench my weight. And I would just was not those guys that were out there competing against teams like USC and UCLA. And, and so it was a real soul searching time for me to really dig in. And I know that when you go out and as you advance through your life, you ultimately uh, ended up being a SEAL. But, it, it, you know, that takes just a, a different kind of motivation. You need to get yourself mentally prepared to take yourself to a place that you probably had never been before. So was there a moment in time for you that you went from starting to become a late bloomer? So now you're starting to kind of grow into your own but you still had to kick it into a whole different gear. I think it was a, I think it was a progressive thing. It started sort of, as I suggested, with me wanting to prove something really to myself. And, you know, my dad was also a little bit of a hard ass. So he was, he came up from his dad was a, you know, post depression era uh, banker from Kansas and had been a very blue collar guy. Never went to college and was kind of a hard guy. So, you know, I kind of grew up, with that, at least on the paternal side, this that that school of uh, of thinking that you know you kind of knock a kid down, you know keep 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 sort of questioning how good they are, and that keeps them sharp, right? And and I think it worked because it it created in me this sort of drive to prove both to myself and my old man that that I was uh, the things I thought I was, but I I had this weird gravitational pull toward hard stuff. Which I'm trying to lose in the next 50 years of my of my yeah. life. I'm not, I'm not hoping to redefine to define myself every day by, you know, what's the hardest thing I can go and do. I'd, I'd like to do the opposite the next 50 years. But so I became a wrestler in high school, and then when I went to college, I was a rower. And those are two sports that, interestingly, statistically, at Buds, which is the SEAL selection program, yeah. they have two of the highest success rates of any sports. And when you think about why it becomes a little obvious in retrospect, right? They're both these two sports that are just grinder sports. Nobody gives a damn about them, right? From a, from a crowd support standpoint, nobody even comes to the matches. Rowing, rowing meets are hard to even watch because most of the race happens 2000 meters away. And, uh, and yet they're these sports that you just show up early in the morning and you grind and you grind and you grind. And that turns out that's pretty good preparation for both SEAL training and for being an entrepreneur. Yeah, for sure. So uh, at the University of Washington, I'm not sure if you ever rode uh, on that lake. Oh yeah, I, I had we had our we had our, our seats beat off our butts a couple of times by UW. During- well, they're good. The Huskies are good, but we used to share the uh, the crew house for a training table, and during the summer we'd stay there. And so we actually saw these guys firsthand being up at 5 a.m., you know, jumping in the lake, cold as can be, not like Southern California where it's warmer climate. And those guys were the most hardcore, physically cardioed out dudes that I, I'd ever know. So, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a believer in what you're saying in terms of just taking it to a different level. I mean, football players, it's more training in, in sprints 
and it is hardcore, but it's on a different level when you're talking about being out there rowing and just cardio, cardio, cardio. You know, yeah, they're just different, they're different kinds of sports, right? Football is, and ironically, football players have the worst success rate at Buds for, I think, a couple of reasons. One, they're, they tend to be big. Yeah. There's no, when you're going through Buds being big. I mean, I was 6'2". When I started the program, I was about 6'2", 2'10", 215 in that in that zone and then by the time that I by the time I got done with hell week I think I was down to like 185 190 and the uh the football players who carry all this extra mass it's just hard right it's a lot of extra weight the other thing is psychologically football is one of these sports where you need maximal effort for a very short period of time then you get to reset and there's generally a lot of crowd approval and support right yeah get the buds first of all it's 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 the opposite of that right you you need to do a series of sprints over the course of a marathon basically that's that's more like what what it's like and, and not only does no one applaud for you it doesn't matter how well you do you're getting nothing but crapped on and 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 driven into the dirt and so the sports like long distance running long distance swimming that have these long grinds but no crowd approval rowing wrestling yeah. Those tend to be the ones that that do the best, right? And some of the other bigger spectator sports like football, basketball, and baseball, you know, don't don't do as well, interestingly. Yeah. So when we're talking about buds, we're talking about kind of the entry eight week. I'm not sure how long exactly it is, but to be uh, well, a seal. Seven months usually. It's seven month months. Of prep, month of prep and then six months of grind. But yeah. So this is really the the like weeding out process of trying to find guys who can actually handle being a seal. And that's just uh, to get into a team. And then from the team, you got to be accepted and there's a whole process that goes on. And that's why you guys are, are badass. So let's talk about the seals. So you're, 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 you go to USC, right. And now there's this whole thing in your mind about, I mean, what, where did that click on about, you know, you can either go be a, a banker <laughs> or, fitness instructor or something a lot of smart so, opportunities yeah. yeah yeah right so uh you know all of a sudden you decide to take a right hand turn and, and it, was there some inspiration was there did you watch a movie it was a top gun i mean what was it that that drove you in that direction well it's funny we, i didn't realize we we're going to be talking about this but i've got you know we, have, we use a, a, a great executive coach a guy named martin hubbard at the core group who and i was meeting with him yesterday and he yeah. asked this very question so so it's fresh in, in my mind you know, I, I didn't have anything to do with the military other than I had a family tradition of it. My stepdad had been a Marine in, in Vietnam, was a Marine Corps a platoon commander. And and then my at my grandparents' level, my grandfather, my grandfather was in the was in the uh, the Army Air Corps back during World War II. But my on my grandmother's side, there was this long tradition of, of military service. So I, I kind of had that in my uh, in my back of my head and if you think back to the you know the mid to the late 80s that was the reagan revolution right where the where the 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 whole concept of service and patriotism was was back in vogue after the after the 70s and then yep. the carter, carter era and uh and i you know i got i got kind of fascinated about two ideas one was to, to serve some kind of public service and the second one was to test myself because i had taken this uh this anthropology class, and I learned about this tribe down in down in Brazil that had this gnarly rite of passage, right? And between boyhood and manhood, and I, and I I can remember thinking, this is about my junior year of college. Why don't we have something like that, right? We just one day we're seventeen, the next day we're we're eighteen, the day before we were a boy, the next day we're deemed a man. That's something wrong, right? With that, and so. So these two ideas were kind of spinning up in my head and they, they crystallized around the idea of military service and specifically, and I, I laugh when I look back on, on this, this idea, it was so naive, but it, it worked out. I wanted to do the thing that was the hardest and hardest being defined by the largest attrition and selection. And when I found, I never even heard of the SEAL teams. I thought it was going to be a Green Beret originally because that was the thing that you know you heard about. Sure. And, uh, but I, but a buddy of mine, uh, at USC, his dad had been a UDT frog man. And he was telling me, Oh God, my dad's just always harassing me to go do this. He'd love to talk to you. And I talked to him and he said, well, you know, 85% of people never make it through training. I was like, really? 
challenge. So I started, I started doing some research and discovered that's actually it's still today. That's, that's roughly the attrition rate of that program uh, from the kids that actually make it there. Right. And there's a pretty good funnel just to get there to the door, then to get through that, you know, the folks who get through 85% of them drop out or get hurt or, you know, otherwise don't, don't continue. So that I thought sounded like, you know, a part of well, look, it's it's a uh, these motivations come from all different sides and levels and people and everything else. And so now you get through you. You are one of the 15 percent that actually make it um, and you move on. So now you're in the seals for 14 years. Right. And and can you tell me anything? I know you guys it's a secret society to a to a certain level. But tell me the types of missions that you went on around the world and, and what team were you part of? Well, I, I was so 14 years. I, I did a few different a few different tours of duty. I spent about six years at, uh, well, actually, let's see, I gotta think back on this. It's about five years at SEAL Team One. Yep. Uh, and mostly focused on Africa and Southeast Asia. And then I did a, a master, I had an opportunity to go get a master's in, in national security affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School. And while I was there, I screened for the special missions unit that you know has become so famous. And uh, got picked up and ended up spending seven years there, in two different tours. One as a troop commander for about four years, and then I came back as a squadron commander. And in between, I went to D.C. and was the lobbyist for Special Ops Command for two years, which was a really interesting experience working on mm-hmm. Capitol Hill and advocating for all of our programs. And uh, you so, know, wait, 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 wait. So, so just going back, just so I, I'm, I'm, I'm. I fill that gap. So you're in Iraq or, or Afghanistan? That's what I'm assuming. No, when I was in at SEAL Team One, I was mostly focused on, on Africa. Southeast Asia, yeah. right? Africa. Yeah. yeah. And then when I ended up uh, at the Special Missions Unit, it's a global focus. So during my time, there was a lot of time spent in Bosnia. You remember all the war criminals oh, yeah. That, yeah. Uh, that allegedly turned themselves into the Hague. Well, it didn't happen exactly like that. Yeah. Uh, they made their way there, but not uh, not because it was it was. The I right. understand. So uh, so mostly that's where my you know interestingly during my my fourteen years I mean at, at 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 the special missions unit we always had employment but it was you know a lot it was a different kind of employment and and at SEAL Team One same thing there was there was great work but a lot of stuff that was going on from say eighty eight through oh one was what you call battlefield prep. A lot of uh, a lot of work with the CIA, right? Doing kind of looking at the the battlefields that that could and and were developing, and doing a lot more reconnaissance. You know, some pretty scary, gnarly stuff. But it wasn't open warfare, right? The way that it became after one Ironically, when I I was promoting out of the field at the end of my squadron command. My wife was pregnant, completely done with the superhero gone nine months a year, yeah. uh, joyous lifestyle of a, of a SEAL spouse. And, and so I can remember thinking, well, you know, the world's a pretty peaceful place. This was sort of July 01. And, you know, Bosnia's wound down. Most of the big like missions are behind us. And so it seemed to me to be a good time to apply to business school at Stanford. I, I really never thought I would get in and have to deliver. It was kind of a deal I cut with my wife to keep her, uh, you know, head in the game. And and I thought it was zero chance I was going to get accepted. But that that ended up being the year that you know yeah. Stanford for a bunch of different reasons thought it would be a good idea to have a seal in their recruiting poster. And uh, so even though I was a mathematical idiot, they let me in. And. Uh, <laughs> And had that kind of spelled the transition, but that 14 years was incredible, right? Had a lot of great real world stuff that mostly in the in highly classified reconnaissance, uh, battlefield prep, working for an internal defense, working with other forces on some of their issues and some of their internal bad guys, a lot of that kind of stuff. The funny thing about being a SEAL that, that people don't know is, I mean, it's, it's, it's damn near as dangerous training as it is on women, right? Because you're always pushing the edge of the envelope to redefine the envelope. And occasionally you find the edge and you know you're there because shit goes wrong and somebody dies. And so I I had more friends by far. uh, If I added up all the all the teammates that I lost over the years, more of them died during training. 
than in the subsequent, you know, combat deployments. And, uh, and that's, that's something that people don't realize is just, you know, guys do a dangerous job every yeah. single day to go to work. No, it's crazy. So I, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm citing the right movie, uh, uh, but Soul Survivor, the, the, the four SEALs that went over to Afghanistan. And uh, one of the guys in that group, Murph, I can't. Yeah, Lone Survivor. Lone Survivor, yeah. And uh, one of the guys in the group, Murph, Murphy, they called him the Murph. Yeah, Mike Murphy. Um, yeah. And so the transition here for us is that he had come up with his own set of exercises. And I've actually tried to do it. You know, it's like 100 sit ups, 100 pull ups. Hundred CrossFit right has has a whole has a whole routine based on 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 Murphy that they call the Murph. Yeah, yeah, no, I, you know I've done it and it's challenging. Um, and you got to run a, a mile in a certain time. I can't remember all the different things, but the bottom line is he was a Freddie Fitness, and when you got to be creative when you're out in the field, and and for you transitioning now over into the whole TRX thing, how you came up with this whole idea, and it just seems logical to me that you know you've got some parachute material and you've got you've got a belt. And so you're trying to like Jerry rig some things. I'm like, how can I train my body and how can I stay fit when I'm in a very closed confined? Is that how it all went out, went down? Well, I, the way that it went down for me, and actually, hey, as long as we're here in my office, yeah. uh, I can actually, I can bust this thing out, which, uh, which doesn't happen in many podcasts. Uh, let me just unhook it here for a second. For me, we were deployed on a, uh, you know, in the in the late '90s, we were we were deploying mid all through the mid '90s. We deployed a ton, right? And and actually, it's funny that the the Clinton administration had kind of come up with a with a strategy that at the time was maddening from from the perspective of a shooter, but it was actually pretty smart foreign policy. And I would call it uh, deterrence through deployment. Yep. So, you know, when there was something bad going on in the world. They'd deploy in one of the tier one forces and you'd come in by cover of darkness and set up. But the thing is, you can only keep a keep a secret, right? That there's big white guys in town for a very short period of time. Yeah. And so in, inevitably the word would leak out like, hey, there's there's some there's some bad hombres over there. Well, that word would quickly spread across yeah. the, you know, the the bad guy network and they'd all disappear. And so for, you know maybe another six months, they'd, they'd think that the, the enforcers were in town and, and they'd, they'd go back to doing whatever it was they normally did in their day job. And that happened a lot, but you never knew when a mission was going to actually go or when it was going to get you know recalled. And so we would end up fully deployed a lot without gear, no good way to train. And yet, you know, SEALs really are kind of a, a pro athlete unit right? A, a pro sports team, it's just a different game, different uniform. And you got to train, but it's kind of challenging when you go into a place for weeks or months and there's no gear. So I had accidentally deployed with, and accidentally, literally with this jujitsu belt yep. that I scooped up off the floor of my, of my cage with, along with a flight suit stuffed into a bag as we were loading out for this counter piracy op. And I ended up overseas sitting there staring at this thing going, oh, well, the jujitsu belt's not super useful at this point, but I was trying to do training to climb up a ladder, right? I was just trying to, trying to basically be able to do pull-ups without any pull-up bars, without any down, you know, cable machines. And so I went and tied a knot in the end of this thing, threw it over this door inside this little warehouse. And I, and I basically did what today we call functional training, right? Training a movement in the training room that, that you need on the field. And my movement was to, you know, climb hand over hand, foot over foot up a, up a cable, caving ladder. So with this thing, I was able to lean back, pull myself up against gravity and then lean back again, pull myself up against gravity. And I thought that was kind of cool. So I started playing with it, you know, and then one, you know, seals are all pretty innovative cats. So, you know, one thing led to another and I ended up going, wait a minute, what if I had a further standoff from the door? And two sides, right? Because then I could do curls and flies and rows. And wait a minute, couldn't I turn around and do presses and flies and you know rollouts and all all kinds of stuff? And so I went over and grabbed about six feet of, of webbing out of out of one of our spare kit boxes that you know we use webbing to repair to for everything. That's one of the little secrets, right? With, with some uh, good good set of webbing, some rigorous tape, and some five fifty cord, you can take over the world. And so we always traveled with that stuff and, 
And, uh, and I went and just pieced this thing together, hand stitched it together with a boat repair kit. And, uh, you know, it doesn't look a whole bunch like today's TRX suspension trainer, but functionally it was pretty darn close. Sure. And that, that was the beginning of, uh, of TRX. So was it, so, so somebody, uh, I, I told, uh, there was a guy that I was riding with yesterday and, and, uh, he goes, what does TRX stand for? And I think it stands for total resistance exercises, correct? Yeah. I took, well, originally it was kind of total body resistance exercise and yeah. I did, you know, which I know should be TBRE, right? But that's not sexy. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, I, I used to describe it to if you and I were sitting on a plane together, you're like, Hey, well, I'm an athlete. You know, what do you do? And, and I'm oh, well, I run the, this fitness product company. Really? What is it? Does it have weights? No, there's no weights. Does, does it stretch? No, no, it doesn't stretch. <laughs> well, how do it work, Randy? Right. And I, and I would end up saying, well, you know, Mark, it's a, it's like a total body resistance exercise system. It uses gravity and your body weight. You're like, Oh, well, that's interesting. You know, and I would describe it like, Oh, you know how to do a pull up, right? Have you ever been on a gymnastics ramp? You know, and, and, uh, and over time, I just kept saying it enough. The I was like total body, total body resistance exercise, TRX. And that's, that's how that stuck. So was it when you're in the, uh, in the seals that, as you're developing this, that, that you were trying to amplify that this could actually be a business or did it really kickstart when you're at Stanford? I didn't think about it as a business at all before I went to Stanford. I, my, my had a good buddy out in the rigger, the, the parachute loft, who was a rigger and he liked to drink beer. So he would make these for guys in exchange for a case of beer. And I just thought that was clever, right? Because yeah. it was a bit of good natured, rivalry between the officers and the enlisted the enlisted guys mock the officers for being these paper pushing dilettantes and the and the officers you know mocked the enlisted guys right back for being these no neck you know, small thinking uh beasts and and it's all in good nature but i i thought as an officer this is a pretty cool thing that i created this tool that you know all the guys thought was was great and wanted them and uh and so that was it i was kind of I was kind of happy with that. It never really occurred to me. I always had in the back of my mind, you know, I wonder. And so when I got into Stanford and I ended up getting invited out to the athlete training center, like they took pity on me as an old commando, right? I was, I was the oldest guy in my class by like six years. Yeah. And, um, and so I'd go out there with, with my straps, hook them up. To, I mean, that's a pretty posh world-class training room, but I'd just take my straps out, hook them up to a squat rack, and just crush these workouts any anything right other than study yeah and uh and over the course of the first year that i was there literally every one of the coaches who'd be in there with their squads would come walking over and look and say like all right tell me about this thing yeah and two minutes later they'd be asking if i could make them a set right for their squad and they'd be telling me why this thing would be great for their athlete and their athlete might be a 300 pound lineman, but then the women's tennis coach, right. T tell me the same thing. And so you're like, well, I'm at business school. That's a pretty broad cross section of humanity right there that I just, yeah. described. everybody seems to think it's cool who really knows exercise and exercise physiology. I wonder if the average bear would use this. And uh, so I used the second year at Stanford as an incubator basically to, to do all of the things, answer a lot of questions, right? And we still got 50% of them wrong when I launched, it turned out. But, but you know, it was, it was enough uh, of, a, of a kind of curated environment, with a lot of smart people around me to put together the bones of a business. And I decided to launch it after I graduated. Hey, this pod is sponsored by Laird Superfoods. So many products to choose from, from your InstaFuel, your coffee, your tea, your smoothies, and I love the superfood creamer and use the hydration powders like the beets, the coconut, the matcha, the turmeric to mix all into my seven summit smoothie. And it's so good. Log on to LairdSuperfood.com and get your 20% off when you use the code MARKP20. Okay? So get your Laird Superfood and I guarantee it will help fuel your journey. Well, those things are a lot of times easier said than done. You know, I've, I've started three or four different businesses and it's, it's literally like pushing a rock up a mountain and it takes a while. Now you have momentum and I think, and you have momentum now going down the other side of the mountain because you've created a brand, but it's taken you 10 plus years to get to that, that magical spot. But I think it goes back again to 
this whole notion about you being a wrestler, you being a, a rower uh, at USC, and then going on into the SEAL to have that mental um, fortitude to keep pushing and pushing and pushing and no matter what, you don't give up. You have all these zigzags and, and adversity issues that come up, uh, whether it's funding, whether it's acceptance of idea, uh, the product to market, all those different things that come in the way. And trying to, again, keep going, keep pushing your way all the way up the mountain some, some, can sometimes for a lot of people be very challenging. Now, the other part of that too is the whole funding issue, right? And the funding, whenever anybody starts a new company, some people are lucky enough to self-fund, but most businesses need some kind of seed funding. How tough was that for you once you got your business plan in place to go out and raise, I think it was the, the first $350,000? Well, it's funny you touch on two, in, in one sentence or one breath, you've covered two, two of the biggest pieces of advice that, that I always give people when they ask me about, hey, what, what's your top advice on becoming an entrepreneur? And number one is always this, come from a rich family. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to do that. But if you, yeah, can, was I. Yep. But if you can, man, that would be a real advantage. And, and then number two is never quit because they're going to be, it, it's funny as I, you know, thought about your your podcast about finding your summit. The, the irony of summits uh, for anybody who spent time in the back country is that there rarely is a summit. There there are a few out there, but mostly there's false summits in life, right? And yeah. if you get to the summit, what you find is you you hit a set of false summits on the way, and every time you get to a false summit, what comes next is the downhill into you know because mountain ranges build on top of each other in most cases. And so you, know, you end up getting higher and higher, but you got to keep going down into the abyss to get to the next summit. And, and during that process, a lot of people quit. And so if you never quit, and if you can engineer it, come from a rich family, then it's all really easy, I think. But, but uh, I had to do it the hard way, which was to go out in the post.com bubble burst in Palo Alto yeah. And somehow try to raise seed money because I had about 50,000 bucks that I had accumulated over 14 years as a SEAL. Yeah. And that instantly right, went up in a, a yeah. puff of smoke. It goes uh, pretty quick. I, I, I used it to get some early inventory and I used it to, uh, to apply for some IP, right? And it was gone. So I turned to the first round was, a, I think, a $350,000 raise. And, uh, and I did it with friends and family. And one of the really early, early investors was our good mutual friend, Eddie Pops. And he, he called, he called me, he was, I don't forget what he was doing. Somehow he was on the Stanford network and he was, I don't remember if he was looking to hire somebody or what was going on, but he stumbled upon my, you know, my something that was on there and, and ended up reaching out to me and saying, Hey, tell me about this thing. And, and before he knew it, I had, uh, you know, convinced him that it'd be a good idea to put money in, which, which probably from this day, it still isn't from his perspective, but it will be uh, when we get to the big liquidity event here in a, in a few years. But uh, I did it with a, you know, bootstrappers, classic bootstrap finance, where you, you raise a little, you set a couple of, of, of pretty easy key benchmarks that you're going to achieve with that money. And then you go do it. Right. And when you do it, the reason they call it a stair step is because you get a disproportionate rise in enterprise value at your next round. Because yeah. people are, I mean, it's all investing, raising investment capital, as you know, is all about sort of de risking the, the investment for the investor. And so when you've done a couple of things, you get a little money in, you do a couple of the things you said you were going to do, well, all of a sudden the perceived risk goes down and, and the, the value goes up. And then you raise a little more. So I think I went, I did three rounds, kind of 350K. I think the second round, the second one I did was about a million and a half. And then the third was a couple million. And uh, all, all in, it was about, about half, you know, five, five million bucks in, in angel money over the course of about five years. Is that the only money you've taken to date? Exactly. Because no, no. What? I should have, it should have been the only money that I took. <clears throat> Uh, but then I made, uh, inarguably the biggest mistake of my life. And I, I raised, uh, some private equity from, from a, a group that, uh, that I wouldn't, that I wouldn't do again. And that really fundamentally changes the game, right? When you take institutional capital, 
it it changes the game in ways that I think entrepreneurs often don't understand how it's going to change the game. And occasionally it works out. Most often, you know, the stories that I hear and I deal with a lot of a lot of early stage companies, you know, most often it turns out to not have been a great idea. And we can talk about about the, the pros and cons and and uh, you know you've obviously got your experience with uh, with VCs as well I think but yeah we we raised a chunk of dough back in sort of 2012 to you know I was following sort of what I learned in business school raise it when you don't need it and we thought at the time we didn't really need it you know we needed it to grow faster but we didn't need it to 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 be operationally self sustaining. And in a retrospect, if I could go back and wind back the clock, I think what I would have done is said, hey, we're going to trim our sales and grow, you know, at the pace that our business can grow at and become, it'll take us a little longer. But once you take institutional capital, you just have to realize the no growth is ever enough, ever. And, you know, you have a super steep growth year. Well, institutional capital just expects the next year will be even steeper, right? And so you really change the game. And because of the financial engineering that goes on and the, and the you know, the introduction of preferred shares with, with special potential rights, suddenly you, you, if you're not careful, you end up creating a circumstance in which the entrepreneur and, and his or her early investors and team are, are in a sublimated class of of equity to the incoming institutional investors, and that that is dangerous because it creates you know a, a unaligned incentive structure. Yeah, well, you got a couple of things going on there. I mean, number one, that when you start giving away money, and you, especially when you go to some kind of in, institutional uh, investor, it's really their bylaws. Sometimes it is the people within the company, but it's all their investors that are in, and it says something like every three to five years they need to have turnover in terms of that investment. And so a lot of those guys aren't thinking about the people and the real drivers. Like you're the driver of that business. You're the name, you're the face. I, I uh, was that same person for a company called Front Porch Classics. It was a gaming company and same type of deal. And the next thing you know, you blink blank. You think it's fun to, 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 to dance with the, the venture people. The next thing you know, you're working for them and no longer it's your company because you lose control. Yeah, I've, I've heard people talk about, you know, you hear entrepreneurs talk about about the 20 years it took them to buy back their companies, right? And and I never quite understood how that can work. Well, now I understand it very well. Because once you take a big slug of equity with preferences in, pretty difficult unless your business just goes skyrockets in valuation. It's difficult to get them out because it's such a big slug of capital that needs to go out of the business. And really, the only way you can get them out is by taking more like them, yeah. Right, and so you're essentially just hence the the, the term recapitalization. You all you're doing is taking that slice which has grown usually ahead of your own, and you're exporting it out of the company and replacing it with a new slice. Right, and the only place you can get that slice is from more private equity. So it's a it's an interesting um, reality that I think a lot of entrepreneurs, certainly I fall in this category, kind of bimble into unawares, and then end up going, "What the hell?" How did that happen? Yeah. You know, live and learn. Well, you're still there. You know, you're still running things. And things have gone very well for you. I mean, despite what you're talking about and, and really trying to keep up with those expectations of, of growth, I think you've done a phenomenal job of really creating a vertically integrated company. There's another guy that, uh, that I've worked out with several times uh, down in Malibu, Laird Hamilton. I'm sure you know his name. Right, yeah. And it's the same type of deal um, where it's non-resistance of, for, for him. I think he's trying to go down the same path as you have gone of really trying to recreate the experience in the pool with weights, all these different exercises that he and, and Gabby have come up with. And, and it's cool. I mean, you are an innovator of this, of really turning around, creating a, a, a set group of, of exercises. I'm sure each one has a different name. And then bringing in various trainers and everything else, training them, having them become certified and then they become your brand ambassadors around the globe, bringing them into all the different gyms. So it's brilliant. I, I no, think it, it is. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily brilliant the way it started. It was more, uh, you know, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that you learn as a SEAL is how to be nimble, right, and how to pivot. Because a lot of times the best plan, you know, doesn't survive the first, the, the first moments of a deployment. 
and you got to have a secondary and a tertiary. And one of the things I realized pretty quickly was this idea of selling into retail early in. In fact, that's that's when Eddie and I really got to know each other well was, was Costco was yep. ready to do a big pilot buy from us. And I went up to Issaquah and sat at, at, uh, at uh, Eddie's big long table and the Costco execs came in and they were going to do this big buy right out the gate. And right at the last minute, it just sort of opened. I, I realized, like, wait a minute, I can't do this. This thing is going to be, first of all, I'm going to have to raise, go raise another half a million bucks just to field the inventory. Yeah. And if it doesn't move, they get to put it back on my on, on the sidewalk in front of my office right at their call. And you're screwed. And I'm screwed. I'm done. Yeah. 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 So I, I'll never forget walking away from that meeting, getting back to my mom's car, right? Because my mom drove me to and from the meeting. And I was thinking to myself, did I just turn down a 20,000 unit pilot order? I'm pretty sure I did. And it turns out, right, it was, it was one of the best decisions I ever made because as, as many, if not all, products uh, will discover early stage, you run into product problems. Yeah. Right? And I had a manufacturing defect that came out in the inventory that I would have right, shipped to Costco. And all that would have been put back onto our the porch in front of our office and that would have been the end of the story and instead right i i didn't and that i went to a trainer trade show and we sold out everything we had and so the the trainers became our not only our first customer and they had credit cards which you know time to cash early stage is really important so the trainer not only became our first level of customer but then they took our product to a couple hundred end users per year in the form of clients. And it's a great model, right? If you can partner with your customer and through them create brand ambassadors who pay you for the privilege of representing you, that's a pretty good model. And so early on, we, we kind of realized that. And ever since, we've been focused on making trainers money. And that's, that's uh, you know, that's kind of our first order of focus at TRX. Well, you've got this mission statement called empower every, everyone in their pursuit of better. And certainly you've done that. I understand your sales are in excess now of 50 million. So that's, I'm sure that's global. Um, where do you see TRX going into the future? Well, it's interesting. I think we're about to, to really hit an inflection point. And, and I say that for a couple of reasons. I mean, we're right now, the business is trending significantly higher. We, we were stuck in a really bad circumstance for about, geez, seven years, uh, about five of which we were trying to exit our private equity guys. We did four full processes, which you'll appreciate you know, how difficult a go-to-market process is. We did four year-long processes in six years. And that is so distracting to, to an organization and to the executives that, that need to be focused on market. Yep. That, you know, really between that and we had a couple of just things that happen as you as you grow. Right. It's early on. You, your, your number one enemy is obscurity. But then as you start to grow, you, you think you're going to be tripping over piles, of hundred dollar bills. But instead, you just get a whole new set of challenges. And one of them for us, we had a, a global explosion of counterfeiters. Yeah. Who the hell knew? You know, I mean, like Louis Vuitton, Gucci, you know, Rolex kind of counterfeiters. And, and it, it almost brought us down. It was such an enormous, all of Southern China, basically every stitch and sew shop in Southern China turned their attention on us from about 2013 to 2017 when we won a big federal infringement case. And man, during that time, that was a lot of headwinds blowing against us. Sure. So really almost in the snap of a finger of, of fingers, we finally recapped the business and, and now we don't have to worry about that for you know, at least another five years. And we won a big federal case, which was really helpful in cleaning up the marketplace of all the counterfeits and other IP infringing knockoffs. So I think that what's going to happen with us now, I mean, we're launching a great big subscription service later this year that's designed to make trainers money. We put 300,000 trainers through our qualification courses over the last 10 years. Well, that's a nice, big, meaty cadre of customers to bring this subscription service to. Just as a point of reference, Zumba, Zumba has about 200,000 that they put through their 
their courses, they monetize those, those guys and gals at hundred million a year in recurring revenue, mm. right? We have 300,000, we monetize at zero dollars a year in recurring revenue up yeah. until now. So you see the problem. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's all about to change. And in addition, you know, we've expanded into the consumer for a lot, for, for 12 years, we were B2B. Now we've added B2C. And so I think that our growth over the next couple of years is going to be pretty extraordinary and our growth in very high margin profit dollars, basically. So, you know, our goal is to become really the Amazon of fitness and, and we're doing it methodically, authentically, but we're getting there. Well, I don't think there's any gym that I've ever been in in the last 10 years that I have not seen a TRX uh, straps hanging down and I've taken them to different, different classes. I love it. I love doing that whole resistance workout. And I tell my friends too, you know, back in college, it was just how much weight could you actually lift? And I've gotten out of that whole routine, especially as I advance and I'm doing these mountains all over the world with Everest coming up of really trying to do just natural body weight. It's amazing between push-ups and, and pull-ups and those types of things and not even bringing in the TRX straps. But if, if you do, it just helps you with flexibility, with stretching, with strength, with fitness, all those things. It gets you a heck of a workout, but you feel as gunned up as I, well, at least for me, as I did back in the day when I was lifting an awful lot of weight. Yeah, you know, that's been the, the, one of the good pieces of fortune we had was this rise of, of what today we call functional training. Yep. You know, and people define it a lot of different ways. Some people define it as training movements, not muscles. Some people define it as, as uh, you know, training specific movements that you then need in life or in sport. I, I actually, I, I think it's even broader than that. It's kind of like small tools, big movements, right? And it's really interesting because if you understand human movement and how to stabilize, destabilize, load, unload, you know, up tempo, down tempo, you can create ghastly workouts, but they're really functional in, in, from the perspective of a human being, right? Because it all starts with movement. If you can move well, yeah. you can do a nice, deep, clean squat, unloaded without pain, right? And then stand yourself back up, firing the right muscles, stabilizing with the core, then you're a vital human. And I think that, that particularly my, my perspective as you know, I'm 53 now, is very different than it was when I was a young frog pup, you know, or a seal pup. I, I, uh, I used to lift a lot. I used to do all that, you know, sort of classic old dumb guy stuff. And the irony is I feel much healthier now than I ever felt in my thirties. I always had something dinged, you know, shoulder, low yeah. back. But as I've done a lot more training over the years that involved core integration, small muscle stabilizers, and then big movements, right? To keep your mobility, be able to do, you know, if not the splits, at least a significant, you know, a significant hip opener and, and have good mobility through the T-spine. Like you find that life like feels pretty good and, and you can maintain your function. And in, like in your case, you, know, you want to drive, climb mountains. Uh, you got to be in shape to do that. And you got to have, got to be really strong, more like a monkey than a bull. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great way to put it. Well, listen, this conversation has been fascinating. I want to talk to you about uh, bringing some straps up to Everest next year. Maybe you'll join me and it should be a, a fun outing, but uh, it's been great. You know, again, uh, finding your summit, really what you're talking about is finding your summits because you've had a lot of iterations going up and down and up and down. And, and it seems like you're on an upward trajectory in terms of going to that ultimate pinnacle. And congratulations on that. And anyways, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, it's going to be an awesome podcast. Hey, man. Well, I'm just happy to be here. I, I, love, the, I love the title, Finding the Summit, because I, I think uh, the thing you can't forget is, is the summit. You may or may not get there. And, and in my case, one thing I've discovered is every time I get close to, to a summit, I just change the goal. Yeah. Right. So, so what that, uh, what that tells me is you better really enjoy the trek along the way. And for the most part, uh, I've been able to do that as an entrepreneur and everything that came before. So hopefully the same for you and uh, the other folks watching your pod. Absolutely. Enjoying the process. All right. He is TRX, Randy Hedrick. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mark.
Hey, and thank you so much for listening to the Find Your Summit podcast. We are so glad to have you along for this journey. And if you enjoy the show, please tell a friend, share it on iTunes, spread it to the planet. We're looking to broadcast this to every person that is out there because, as you know, everybody has their own summit that they're going after. Okay, if you're looking to follow my journey, you can find that through my social links on markpattisonnfl.com. That's Mark, M-A-R-K, Patterson, P-A-T-T-I-S-O-N, NFL.com. So until the next podcast, just remember, clear eyes, full hearts, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion, so make it happen. Thank you. Bye. Hey, thank you so much for dropping in and listening to another amazing episode of Finding Your Summit. Truly incredible people doing spectacular things in life, and I hope you were inspired just like I continue to be. Look, I am super grateful that you came in and subscribed to this pod and would be more than appreciative if you gave the show a ratings and review on iTunes. Trust me, it matters. And then also go share it with your friends, of course. Okay, until next week, go do something great, and remember, it takes a little more to make a champion. Bye.